Hello, everybody, and welcome again to The Meeting House, where we have conversation on religion and American life. I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody, coming to you today from our studios in the Golden Isles of Georgia, a beautiful place down here, Glen County, Georgia, famous for the marshes of Glen and also the beaches and many, many other things, St. Simons Island, Sea Island, Jekyll Island, and Brunswick, Georgia. Today I'm continuing my four-part series entitled Race, Religion, and Us. And those of you who've been following know that this I'm dealing with the aftermath of the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey, which happened just a few miles from our studio, and all of the racial tension and results that flow that flowed out of that and out of the other things that happened, uh, the murder of George Floyd, of course, in Minneapolis last summer as well. We're looking at the impact of these events on the religious, political, legal culture down here and across the country. My guest today, we expect him to drop in the meeting house here shortly, a noted Brunswick attorney, William Legan formerly our state senator and played a leading role in some of the legal and political things that happened after the murder and all of that became public. But as always, I have a commentary at the end of the show today, unless we get so caught up in the conversation, uh, I don't have time for it, but my, uh, my commentary is next year in Jerusalem, question mark. And of course I've got all the news I actually have six stories today instead of the five that I printed out in the newsletter last night. All of it brought to you by PerfectoCoffeeInc.com. Perfecto Coffee out of California. The best you can buy. Order some coffee from them today. I always give my guest a pack of this uh, Perfecto Coffee and I'd like for you to order some too. PerfectoCoffeeInc.com is their website. So now the news from New York City, the public broadcasting service, that's PBS, has premiered this past week, a two hour documentary on the life and ministry of the famed evangelist, Billy Graham. I'll have to say very influential in my life as I, came into the ministry when he was at the height of his influence. Director Sarah Colt has devoted nearly two years to the projects, sifting through 300 hours of archival video and audio, looking at nearly 2,000 photographs, and conducting 19 on-air interviews. The series focuses more on the public success of Graham, especially with celebrities of all kinds, and less on the millions of ordinary people like myself who were influenced by Graham's preaching. Graham died in 2018 at the age of 99. I have visited his grave, as a matter of fact, uh, not too far from our North Carolina studio, took my grandson over there. On the stone, I might say, uh, at his grave is a quote from another famed evangelist by the name of Dwight L. Moody, who died in 1899. From Frankfort, Kentucky, two cases, legal wrangling over contentious issues with religious overtones are working their way to resolution. In Kentucky, a Baptist group, Sunrise Children's Services, is in a tussle with the state authorities over how to deal with LBGTQ families who want to adopt. The dilemma they face is how to honor the religious values of the ministry 
while obeying the law protecting people's constitutional rights. And on abortion, always in the news, it seems, the Supreme Court of the United States agreed to hear a case from Mississippi that presents a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade. That decision in 1973 permits abortion under certain circumstances. From Washington, D.C., a global prayer emphasis among Roman Catholics came to the United States last week. The Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., hosted a special ceremony focused on praying the rosary. They joined other Marian shrines worldwide in an effort initiated by Pope Francis to pray for an end to the COVID pandemic. Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of Washington, D.C., formerly the Archbishop of Atlanta, led the prayer service this past Monday, praying for, quote, all world leaders and for all heads of international organizations, end quote. From Orlando, Florida, the epicenter of the Christian charismatic movement is in Orlando, Florida, and they issue a regular summary of the news, just like we do here in the meeting house. The five stories they are reporting this week are the prophecies last fall that Donald Trump would lose the presidential election. Of course, those prophecies were overshadowed by a wave of prophecies that he would win. Number two, the dismissal of popular prophet Jeff Jansen for, quote, unscriptural, unbiblical behavior, end quote. The death of pastor, evangelist, and faith healer Ernst Angeli, which we reported last week in the meeting house. The prediction by prophet Cindy McGill of a coming storm that will, quote, attract the world's attention, end quote. And then five, a call for Christian parents to remove their children from, quote, government schools, end quote. And from Washington, D.C., once again, the Pew Research Center on Religion and Public Life issued a report of their extensive survey of the Jewish community in the United States. It was conducted over an eight-month period ending last June, that is almost a year ago. They list 10 key findings, findings including a total Jewish population of 7.4 million, a growing racial and ethnic diversity among the Jews, less religious activity among Jews than on the American population in general, political liberalism as the dominant uh, political orientation, except among Orthodox Jews, a sense of rising anti-Semitism in the United States, affirming the importance of Israel, and engaging in cultural activities, especially cooking, Now, one more piece of news that just came out two days ago. As you know, we've been reporting regularly on the turmoil in the Southern Baptist Convention. They gather for their annual convention in three weeks. There is so much going on. And then this week, what I think is the leading intellectual in the Southern Baptist Con Convention, Russell, Russell Moore, head of their Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, He's been under a lot of criticism because he's what they call a never Trumpster. Well, he resigned this week to take a job as a public theologian with Christianity Today. And there's been a lot of reaction to that all across Twitterdom and social media. I'll have more to say about all of this in just, and maybe next week. That's all the news, or at least those are six stories out of the meeting house, sponsored by Perfecto Coffee of California. Order some of their coffee. I'm Dwight Moody in the meeting house. I'll be back in just a minute, picking up our four week theme on race, religion, and us with local attorney, William Ligon. I'll be back in just a minute. I can. Gotcha.
Hello, everybody. That's the music of the old Shaker song, Simple Gifts, part of uh, Aaron Copeland's wonderful symphony, Appalachian Spring, recorded in 1945 by the London Philharmonic. We play it, of course, every week. You're listening to The Meeting House. I'm your host, Dwight Moody, coming to you from our studios in the Golden Isles of Georgia. This is week three in our series on race, religion, and us. Today, my guest is well-known attorney in Brunswick, Georgia. He has a well-established and wide-ranging practice in Glenn County, and I should give full disclosure, I've sought his help on more than one occasion. <laughs> Welcome to the meeting house, William. Thank you, Dwight. Appreciate you having me on. Great. We're delighted that you're here. And uh, we've been talking actually all year, as everybody has, about um, the Ahmaud Aubrey affair. And I'm focused really on its aftermath. And uh, at the time, let me just start here. At the time, William, uh, February 23rd of last year, you were, I believe, our elected state senator. Is that right? That's right. I was still in office when that that happened. When were you first elected? How long did you serve? I served in the, in the state Senate for 10 years, elected and start, my first term started in 2011. Wow. Wow. Very interesting times uh, to be uh, serving in Georgia. It's been an interesting year in Georgia, hasn't it, William? It, it, it sure has. We've had a lot going on here. From a COVID lot going on. Now, election, so. well, I want to ask you about one specific thing. We, okay. I've reported and had many conversations over the last year about the uh, Ahmad Aubrey affair from many right. different angles. Sure. But in your capacity as a state senator last year, you initiated some legislation at the state level to in response to it. Isn't that right? Well, actually, we had... Um, already had some legislation pending that dealt specifically with the Glenn County Police Department. It, it, it was not um, initially tied to the Ahmaud Arbery case. There had been issues um, with the department and some recommendations that had been made by a grand jury. In fact, two grand juries to allow the um, people of Glenn County to vote uh, to transfer the uh, law enforcement from the Glenn County Police Department to the Glenn County Sheriff because the sheriff was elected countywide and there was some thought that there might be more accountability and a little more uh, change and improvement to the operations of the department being brought uh, forth if it went to the sheriff. So, As I recall, the police chief was actually on probation uh, um, on February 23rd. Isn't that right? Um, yes, he had been suspended from his, from his duties or was that was happening at about the time that Am Ahmaud Arbery was shot and, and killed. Um, and really that was somewhat of a catalyst mm -hmm. to, um, the legislation that, that was brought forward and really got it moving again through the legislature. Um, so there was some relationship there between that occurrence and, and the bill but really it was already ongoing before this ever happened. Well, I'm a fairly new resident of Glenn County and I really wasn't aware uh, of all this background. Right. But I, I do remember that once we all got alerted to the Ahmaud Aubrey uh, killing, uh, our attention then was brought to it. So if I, re if I remember right, there were there were three bills at the state legislature that passed. Uh, what were they designed to do? You said they were designed to, uh, in a kind of convoluted way, I guess, to allow the people to shift policing right. from the police force to the sheriff. Right. It, it allowed, well, in, in Georgia, traditionally law enforcement in each county has been handled by the sheriff. And there are only maybe around 11 counties that have both the sheriff and a county police department. And it's worked well and you know, in most areas, sometimes you have a problem, but um, it, it's dealt with. And so this bill would have allowed the citizens of Glenn County to, to vote uh, in an election to determine 
where their law enforcement would be administered in the county. And of course, that that bill um, passed. There was some litigation over it, and ultimately a judge struck it down. Uh, the, the state chose not to appeal it to the Court of Appeals. And so, you know, that's where it, where it rests right now. Now, as a layman in all of this uh, uh, criminal justice stuff, the, uh, the sheriff uh, is primarily an officer of the law in the county. Is that right? Yes. Well, the sheriff is actually a constitutional officer. That office is provided for in, in, in the Georgia Constitution, and he is um, charged with law enforcement in the county, directly accountable to the people, to the voters. Um, and, you know, with, with the county police department, there's some separation there. They, they work more through a county commission and through the, the county administrator. So that connection to the voters not qu is not quite as strong in, in that regard. So the situation right now in Glenn County is that the sheriff is right now the primary criminal justice officer in the county. But then we have. A, well, a, well, right now, the, the sheriff in Glenn County, the sheriff is administering the, the jail. And he has, I think he has some responsibilities, maybe on patrol and some other issues. But that is, and also the court security at the courthouse. But the primary county law enforcement, um, I is see, by the Glenn County Police Department. The and the Glenn County Police Department then covers the whole county, including oh, well, incorporated areas. And that's right, except for the city of Brunswick, which has its own police department. Really? Yes. So we have a the Brunswick Police Department, the County Police Department, and the County Sheriff. That's right. You're exactly right. I see. I see. Well, I can understand how that can that could get confusing. Sure. And uh, Satilla Shores, where the Mott Aubrey event happened, is in the county, I guess, isn't it? It's in Glenn County. It's not in the city of Brunswick. Now, the county attorney uh, would have... a jurisdiction over the whole county and Brunswick, right? Well, that would be the district attorney. In, right, the district in attorney. Terms, right, in terms of prosecution of crimes and in particular felonies such as this, that would be the district attorney. So uh, these bills that you helped to push through the state legislature uh, a year ago uh, were declared unconstitutional at the state level, that is, uh, against the state constitution. Right, that's right. And they were not appealed. So the situation right now, uh, organizationally, structure-wise, is the same as it was last February 23rd. That's right, except that there have been some changes within the police department, you know, probably uh, for the good. Uh, the administration that was, uh, or, the, or the head of that department is no longer there. He's been dismissed by the county, um, and things seem to have, have leveled out a little bit. There's been some um, good leadership coming in and there's more work that's ongoing. So in a sense, the bills were also, I would say, a catalyst um, mm -hmm. that helped mm -hmm. shine uh, sunshine on the issue. And, uh, you know, were part of bringing about some positive change, you know, for the people of Glen County. Well, just again, as a layman watching, watching all of this happen, uh, it was immediately apparent that, that there was a lot of discontent with the, with the criminal justice apparatus in the county. But then uh, the, the state got involved and appointed a judge from Savannah, appointed a prosecutor from Atlanta. Right. So they were, they were not happy with the criminal justice apparatus in this, in this, in the county, were they? Well, um, I don't know that I could say that they weren't happy where they were or were not happy, but I know that once the state uh, became involved, then you saw uh, some indictments um, mm -hmm. come down and, and, and the case started to progress and move uh, much quicker. And, and the reason, you know, that they appointed, you know, judges because they, they wanted someone that didn't have any connection to our area. Right. Here. And, um, and of course, now they've set a trial date for October, which, you know, we've already watched uh, the George Floyd trial. Right. He was he was killed after Ahmaud Aubrey. 
Right. But he's already finished with his trial and we're not even due to start until October. That's right. That's right. Well, sometimes, you know, different systems have different time schedules and, and there has been a little bit of turnover in this case. I believe the mm -hmm. uh, original prosecuting attorney right. from Atlanta uh, moved on and had to appoint a new uh, prosecutor. And right. so, of course, that one, that person would need to get up to speed and and become acquainted with the case to to properly prepare for the trial. Now, do you ever have uh, handle criminal cases? No, thank the Lord, I don't. <laughs> I, I hear you. I have did a few in my early years, but I just quickly decided that I, I much that what? prefer the civil side. Yeah, I, I hear you. Well, now, of course, one of the things that happened as a result of this whole thing was the vote to displace the district attorney. Right. Uh, I remember, you know, we had to have a write-in campaign. Uh, I mean, we had to sign petitions to get a new name on the ballot. Uh, I was down at the pier uh, and was stopped by a lady with a clipboard and she asked me if I was a voter and I said yes and I signed I signed up. Were you, were you surprised uh, that the district the sitting district attorney was defeated? Uh, well, I didn't really know how that would that would uh, pan out. You know, a, an incumbent um, has a pretty mm -hmm. uh, strong position and a good opportunity to remain in office. Um, but certainly uh, the challenger mounted a very um, a successful campaign and worked very hard and was able to, to unseat our district attorney. So Mr. Higgins did. So. Yes. Yes, he did. And I guess he's been in office now since, since January or about that right. time. That's right. The, the Ahmaud Aubrey episode, as you know, was the first in a string of very public events. As right. a matter of fact, uh, I think it was just a week or so, after this one, uh, Brianna Taylor in Louisville was killed. And uh, I'm from Kentucky, so I have followed that whole thing very carefully as well. And then you remember the episode in Central Park in New York City, where right. there was a black man out bird watching and a woman uh, called uh, the cops on him for evidently no reason. And then, of course, the Minneapolis. I frequently say that the fuse that burned through Louisville, New York, and Minneapolis was lit in Brunswick, Georgia. And uh, of course, when it, it burned all the way through up to Minneapolis and then boom, it exploded. And right. In many ways went worldwide. Uh, Except what that, if, that, you know, there, there was a big difference uh, between the re reaction to these events in Brunswick and in some of the other places. And I have to say that our community came together. Um, a lot of, um, you know, white pastors, black pastors came together and worked hard to try to keep peace in our community and avoid further destruction of, of property, harm to people. And so in that regard, I'm very, very proud of our community and the mm -hmm. work that we did here, you know, to keep the peace and really to prove to, to the world that, you know, change can come and, and issues can be addressed without tearing up our communities. And if we're willing to listen and work with each other uh, and, and just grab the problems, face the problems head on, the issues head on and deal with them, then positive things can happen and we don't destroy um, our community and hurt really innocent people who had nothing to do with with the particular tragic event. So I'm very proud of our community and our community leaders for for working together on that. Yes, I I want to say I concur with all of that. Uh, Rabbi Rachel Bregman has been a frequent guest on my show. Um, Pastor John Perry has been a frequent guest on, on my show. Uh, my pastor at the time, Tony Lankford, uh, was involved. Uh, Cornell Harvey has been on my show. And I have been a part of, maybe you know, that uh, uh, the ministers have been in a long-running Zoom uh, conversation 
and training session that's been going on uh, about six or eight months. Uh, and I have been a part of that, uh, have made a lot of friends and uh, we have, uh, we've been led by out of, out of the area consultants about how to talk about race, how to listen, uh, how to, how to understand what's going on. And it, it has been, it, it has been a model for what needs to happen in a lot of communities. That's right. And I, I'm, I'm proud of those people who took the lead on that. And I'm, I'm proud to have been a, a part of it. So, uh, but all of this race and, uh, criminal and legal stuff, of course, was the backdrop to the, the elections last fall. Right. And, uh, of course, shockingly, uh, the, the Democrats carried Georgia at the presidential le level, not so much at the, at the, at the state level. And then right. double shockingly, January the third, we elected two Democrats, including a black Baptist preacher. Right. How shocking is that, William? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know that it, it it's shocking. I think it certainly was surprising. And, and there were a lot of questions about uh, the election and really the integrity of the election. And mm -hmm. and I was involved in, in holding a lot of hearings on that in, in December. Really? And, uh, um, yeah. In, in our Senate, we looked into it and, you know, I, I my personal opinion, just from all the evidence that I saw, is that there were some there was fraud and there were some irregularities and misconduct, which, in my opinion, placed the results of the election in doubt. Um, and, you know, when when you, for example, see election officials telling the eyes and ears of the public that we're going to shut down the counting. And then when the press and the observer. They pull boxes out and count enough ballots to change the election. That's an irregularity in my, under our election law calls the election into question. And then you have with the um, drop boxes, there's uh, boxes of ballots that came in without proper chain of custody, no one knowing where those ballots had been or how they had been handled, which um, in my opinion calls the election in question. So that was a a catalyst for some of the election reform that we that we saw come out in, in the last legislative session. Of course, I wasn't there when when those bills passed. But, you know, the idea of that is to secure the integrity of the election, because if the public does not have the confidence that their votes count, that they're not being negated by either fraud or or by individuals voting who really are not entitled to vote because they may not be citizens or or they don't meet may not meet the requirements of the law then really you know confidence in governance and our system of governance breaks down and you know we need to to secure that vote and i think that's one of the functions of government is to protect that so and yet at the same time the secretary of state in georgia himself a, a, a republican and the director of, of elections, himself a Republican, both of them said that this was the most successful and safest election that they <laughs> knew of in Georgia. <laughs> well, I don't know where they were because they certainly, uh, if you looked at the evidence that came out at the hearings that I held, you cannot say that with a straight face. And I think they're just, they're just absolutely wrong about that. Um, and frankly, it, when you look at their conduct leading up to the election, I think there are issues there as well. They entered into an agreement affecting our election, which they had no authority to do. The, that uh, the, It is the legislature that determines how, when, and where the elections are to be conducted. And any agreement that the Secretary of State entered into in any uh, litigation or court case or with anyone else should have been approved by the legislature. And for, for instance, yeah. using these drop boxes. That's right. That should should not have happened. Um, Do you think the drop boxes, uh, uh, but they now are authorized by this these new regulations, right? right? There, there have been some changes in those and where they're located. 
and I think they have to be located inside of certain buildings, so perhaps that will secure it. The problem with the drop box is that it opens up the door for ballot harvesting, where pe which is illegal in Georgia, where people can go in and go around and collect votes from people, and maybe they know what they're, who they're voting for, maybe they don't. And then they go in and they stuff those ballot boxes. And, you know, then you have that, and then you have the question. Now, wait a minute, but you used the phrase stuff the ballot boxes. You right. mean just collect their neighbor's ballots. Collect their, neighbor, their neighbor's ballots, yes. The neighbor's, the, the, the neighbor's vote. The neighbor's and, and go in and stuff the ballot box. And, or just, well, you know, I normally think of the phrase stuff the ballot box as something illegal. But, you know, if I but, were to take no, my wife's no. ballot and no. put it, in the box that's, that's not stuffing that that is that is legal but it is illegal for you to go to your neighbors and to go to friends and and to go around in the community and pick up ballots and putting in the in in the box and because it's an illegal vote i call it a ballot stuffing so, okay if i were to pick up my neighbor's ballot and take it down to the post office is that legal you you may be able to do that. There are certain there are certain requirements that have to happen. I think you you may have to uh, drop it in the uh, mailbox yourself. That's what there I mean. Certain individuals that can that can you have to be either be a family member or some sort of guardian or custodian in order to handle that ballot for the person that's casting the vote. The vote. Really? Yes, there has to be some relationship. Is, there. is that the new law, or was that no? Has that, that been the case? That, so that's been the law. Um, there have been restrictions on who can handle those ballots on abs for absentee ballots in the law for some time. Do you vote by by mail? No, I go and vote in person. I'll tell you, I uh, I had never voted by mail until this last election, I guess. Um, it's nice, and uh, I, I like it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I mailed my ballot in, and when I received it, I mean, when they received it, I got a phone call, an email, and a text from the election officials saying that my ballot had, had been received and counted. I was, I was very impressed with that. Well, there were a lot of problems with it, and I saw that as part of our hearings as well. We saw ballots being mailed to people that had not been lived in Georgia for five or six years that were registered elsewhere. I have a ballot uh, uh, that was sent to a, an actual ballot, not a ballot application that was sent to a, a person in Statesboro. And it was addressed to someone who had not been affiliated with that address for 20 years. So uh, they, to, to, to say that, that it, you know, some places everything went well, but in a lot of places there were, there were issues and particularly in the metro Atlanta area, there were, there were problems with the election. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of criticism of these uh, new laws, as you know, um, not only in Georgia, but in Republican dominated states all across the country. Uh, so th that fact, of course, uh, cast a shadow on all of these things. You know, if it's just Republicans who are, well, you know, you know, passing these laws, you know, you, we, we can either believe the truth or we can believe a lie. And the question is, is it a good thing to try to secure the vote and make sure that 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 the people who are voting really are the people that, that are? in yeah. the vote? No, no problem and, there. Whether and, you vote by a drop box or a ballot or in person, that's right. important. And and what this the one of the things that the new election law did is require some uh further authentication uh, in the absentee ballot arena. So you have to give a copy of your driver's license or your ID. I mean, if you go, uh, you know, to get on an airplane, you have to give an ID because you have to show that you are who you say you are. Okay. And, uh, okay. So, okay. So let's talk about the water. <laughs> all right. You know, uh, this new law uh, prohibits people uh, as I understand it, from passing out water to people who are standing in line. Is, is I, this right? I, I don't think that's <clears throat> that's correct. I think that, that you can get some water. If you need water, you can you can have access to that. But what was happening is that you people were having up food booths and giving away gifts and doing things 
just to try to, you know, to influence the vote in a way that wasn't correct. And that's what that law was intended to do. And and so, but does it prohibit uh, giving no. food or water to people standing in line? If you need water, you can you can get a water, you know, and and there there may be limitations on the on how close you could have your water stand to the to the lines and to the polling place. But to say that you can't give anyone water, that's a mischaracterization of the law and it's just simply not true. Hmm. Well, then there's a lot of mischaracterization out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A mischaracterization. Listen, but, you know, uh, on the ups. The, 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 after the passage of this law, yeah, the voting laws in the state of New York and Delaware are more stringent than the voting laws in Georgia. And so what does that tell you? That tells you that there's some mis, you know, misconceptions about about the Georgia law and what it does to try to secure the vote. So, well, you know, I think we both can say, at least this is what I think. Uh, the not only in Georgia but across the country, the largest voting turnout I think ever, and uh, certainly uh, the political environment generate a lot of interest and a lot of participation in the political process. And this overall is good. Right. Don't you think? Sure. I think it's good. I, I yeah. mean, we, you know, I think that Republicans believe in securing the vote and transparency and, and, and making sure that everything is, is straightforward and that there's no cheating. And, you know, it, if you lose, you lose, you need to know that you lost. If, if, if you really lost, but if you lost because of cheating, then that's a problem because then you really don't know what caused you to lose. Was it your ideas, your position? Was it how you presented yourself? And, and that's not right. It doesn't lead to healthy debate and healthy dialogue and really ideas are not truly tested and proven. Um, well, then here's, of course, the, the big question is, do you right. think Joe Biden won fair and square? I don't. Really? I don't. Do you think our two senators won fair and square? I'm not so sure because we had the same system in place um, for that election as we did for the presidential election. Um, but then, of course, there could have been some discouragement on the part of Republican voters in that in that um, race. Was. There's mm -hmm. there's there's some question in my mind about that. But I do think that some of the same um same things happened in that election as they did in the presidential election it may not have happened to the same degree so no one really knows i can't say on that election well you've evidently got a lot of company in the republican party ab about right. your your skepticism about the election um and uh, this raises the stakes evidently on the 2022 elections it's coming sure. around yep. next year uh, well, let's hope that whoever's running elections everywhere um, uh, can facilitate a, a fair um, ele election because I, I'm like everybody else. I think it's important that things be fair right. and above, above board and tra transparent. Um, what do you think about what's going on out there in Arizona? Well, I think we need to see what's going on there. I mean, I, I've generally followed it and... Yeah. You know, the question is, what? why do the election officials, why are they giving those that, that Senate such a hard time and trying to, to have an audit of what happened? I mean, we need to know what happened. And if there was no fraud, then, hey, turn it over and let them see it and let us all know. But when you sit there and resist and hide and, and, and you know, make it difficult to, to see what happened, then that raises questions and certainly raises more suspicions about the integrity of the vote there. And so you think the this inspection or this audit of what's going on in Arizona is a first class uh, appropriate professional audit? Well, I'm, the, the state Senate is handling it there and they're in charge of the elections. I mean, they, they set the law. They can have the parameters of what's going on. So, I mean, if, if <laughs> You know, they, they make laws. Certainly they're capable of doing that and getting qualified people in there to look at it. And let's see their results. And certainly the, they're, they're, the way they're handling it, that can be reviewed and can be subject to challenge. 
But why hide the evidence? Why, why, why are they doing that? That raises a question. So well, you, you, you have these strong c convictions, but yet you chose not to run again. What, what was behind that? Uh, no, are you going to retire? Or? <laughs> I'd already made a decision had to you? run again, um, you know, way months ago. And I had served for 10 years and just thought it was time to move on. Yeah. After a period of time, you need to get out of the way and let someone else take it. Well, William, I want to say thank you for your service. Uh, I'm glad to know you. I honor you as a public servant and as a, a state senator and as, as a lawyer. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show today and for talking to us, quite frankly, and straightforward about uh, the way you see things and all of that. God bless you. Maybe uh, down the road, uh, you can come back into the meeting house. Well, thank you for having me. And I've had an, uh, uh, a good time just talking to you and exchanging ideas and points of view. So, Great. Uh, you know, the, uh, we're sponsored by a coffee company out in, in California, and I'm going to send you a bag of, of their coffee. I'll send it to your office uh, and you can enjoy that. And every time you lift a, a cup of that coffee, you can think about I'll the meeting house. Okay. We'll do it. Thank, Thank you, William. I'll be back in just a minute with my commentary next year in Jerusalem. By the way, William, yes. have you have you been to Israel? No, I have not. I oh, never... OK. So this is your chance to go, William. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, one of the first things I did, if I can <laughs> extend this a little bit. First thing I did when I moved to the county was research the religious history of Glen County. And of course, your dad's name came up very prominently as a very prominent minister in our county. And, um, but anyway, I am uh, uh, leading, I don't know, my sixth or eighth uh, tour to Israel next summer. I'd be delighted for you to, uh, to go with us next May. Well, perhaps I can. <laughs> So. Blessings on you. Have a, have a great day. Thank you. This yeah. is Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. I'll be back in just a minute. Bye, Dwight. Bye-bye. Next year in Jerusalem, question mark. Once when leading a tour of Israel some 25 years ago, we had to change our itinerary in midstream, so to speak. We were exploring Upper Galilee and there were rockets being launched from Lebanon into Israel. Not like today when the rockets are coming from the south, from Gaza, and the planes are bombing Gaza and people are dying. And not like the, that day in the fall of 1973, when I saw the jets streak overhead of Jerusalem and a few hours later, tanks rolled through Jerusalem. It was October 6th, Shabbat, Yom Kippur, war. I was a student in Israel at the time and remember all the events of that famous war very, very vividly. All of these episodes though, have one thing in common, a struggle for land and freedom and security, a place to call home, justice, for a way for people to be the kind of people God has called them to be, Israelis and Arabs, Lebanese and Egyptians, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and people of no faith at all. I love Israel. I was predisposed to love the people, the land and the history. From the day that public bus, the Egged bus, for those of you who've been over there, took us up from Tel Aviv, from the airport to Jerusalem, just as Shabbat was coming to a close. Mia Shireen was swarming with Orthodox Jews and I remember driving down those narrow uh, roads in old Jerusalem. They dropped us off at the Jaffa Gate. We caught a, ca a cab over to the school. I have loved Jerusalem and Caesarea and Megiddo and the Arbel. I love the people of the old city and the people of the new city, the Sabras and the immigrants, 
the Muslims and the Jews, the Christians, the past and the future. But I also don't love Israel. Not the segregating, dominating, bombing Israel that refuses to do justice and love mercy in a region filled with second-class citizens and first-class despair. Not the Israel that demands that its need for peace and security always take priority over the needs of others who also need space and security, health and prosperity the third class weapons thrown over desert sands into Israel, remind me of the Molotov cocktails used to burn buildings when the urban poor in the United States rebel against the living conditions of the ghettos that too often form the core of our own cities. They are heaves of, de of desperation, we might say, a signal to the watching world that things are not right, not fair, not bearable. Israel has responded far out of proportion to the immediate provocation, perhaps because they understand that these flimsy projectiles landing in their towns far understate the depth of desperation that fill the streets of places like Gaza, perhaps because the relative strength of the two combatants, the modernized, militarized nation versus the disorganized, disenchanted tribe, allows Israel to do whatever it wants, like a uniformed officer beating a protester near unto death. Why is it, uh, which is why my pilgrimage to Israel, the West Bank and the surrounding spaces like Jordan and Egypt and such are as much about modern history as they are about ancient history, as much about the plight of the Palestinians as the progress of the Israelis, as much about what the Bible says to us today that's what the Bible records for us of yesterday. Which is why one year from now, I plan to be in Jerusalem. Touring and teaching, listening and learning, pointing out and pushing back, leading a group of courageous travelers and leaving plenty of time and space to, as we say, drink it all in. 16 days from start to finish beginning in the beautiful coastal city of Caesarea, the center of Roman authority in the time of Jesus, the place where Simon Peter first learned that God is no respecter of persons and receives all who seek after God and strive for justice. We will end with four days in Jerusalem, the walled city, the Holocaust Memorial named Yad Vashem, the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Israeli Museum, followed by three days in Egypt, Coptic monasteries, ancient pyramids, and that overwhelming megatropolis called Cairo. Topography, geography, geology, balance my fascination with history, language, and migration, all filtered through a lifelong interest in Jesus, the places where he slept, the people he addressed, the warnings he gave, the wisdom he shared, and the place where they laid him and sealed tight with a stone. Evil men killed him, Simon Peter said on the day of Pentecost, but God raised him from the dead. And in this, it is this risen Lord that calls me to welcome all who seek the truth who serve all and to serve all who raise empty hands or empty hearts and to bless all who do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. So come go with me to Jerusalem next year, next year in Jerusalem, exclamation point. I'm Dwight Moody in the meeting house. I'll be back in just a minute. Well, maybe like William Ligon, my guest in the meeting house today, you've never been to Israel. 
or maybe you've been like I have, I've been many times, but I always want to go back. But if you've never been, you might like to travel with me next year. I'm hoping actually to take my grandson. Here's his picture. Sam is his name. He'll be 13 years old next year. I'm hoping to take him to, to visit the, the great city of Jerusalem. He's very active in a Methodist church up in Charlotte. And uh, when I go to preach, I as often as possible take him with me to read the scriptures. He's very, very good. But I'm going to take him, I hope, to visit Caesarea and then take him up Mount Carmel, made famous by Elijah, and then to the Megiddo Pass and the great city of Megiddo. I hope to take him to Nazareth and get on one of those boats and take a ride on this, what the Bible calls both the uh, Sea of Galilee and the, and the Lake of Tiberias. We're going to go to Caesarea Philippi, you know, where, where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then ask, who do you say that I am? We're going to go down the Jordan Valley, Beit Shan, Jericho, Qumran, Ein Gedi, where David fled from the wrath of Saul. We'll get out of our bus a little bit and wade and swim, try to in the, in the Dead Sea. We're going to go to Masada, ride the car up to the top of that incredible place. And then we'll ride the road up to Jerusalem. It's the same road through Jericho and the Roman road that uh, Jesus walked on his last journey. You know, when I lived over there, uh, I had a motorcycle. I know some of you will find that hard to believe. Uh, I'd get on that motorcycle and you could, even if you just had a bike, uh, a non-motorized bike, you could get on the bike and coast from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Going back up, of course, is another matter. And, you know, my little Vespa, putt, 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 all the way up to Jer Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, to, first to Bethany, and then the, the Mount of Olives, the old city of David, the Gihon Spring through Hezekiah's Tunnel. You know, I think Hezekiah's Tunnel is the most authentic site in all of Israel, all of the Holy Land. It was a, a water channel cut through solid rock to divert the water from outside of the city, the Gihon Spring, under the city into a pool that came to be called the Pool of Siloam. They did that for security reasons. But you can walk through it now with the rock walls touching your shoulders on both sides. You have to have a candle or a flashlight. Water up to your waist. And then, of course, exploring Temple Mount, all the excavations that are ongoing there. Then the, the new city. It's a great place to drive through the new city. And then we're going to get on a plane and drive from Tel Aviv over to Cairo. I've been to Cairo as I've been to Sinai. I've been to Jordan. Cairo is just an amazing place. I remember the first time I was there. But a, a teeming place. So fascinating. We're going to go to the Coptic mu uh, monastery. I've gotten very interested in the Coptic uh, wing of the Christian faith, reputed to be the oldest, of course, Christian community, along with the Antiochian Orthodox people. The Coptic faith, of course, traces its beginning to the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, as described in the book of Acts. You remember when Philip baptized that man who had come down from the king's, from the queen's court to worship in, in Jerusalem. And he was on his way back and Philip climbed up in his chariot, talked to him about the scriptures and, and about Jesus. And the man said, what is keeping me from being baptized? It is a great question. That's what we're going to do next May. I'll soon have all of this information up on the website. I'll keep you posted about all of it. But if you're interested, send me an email or call me or text me. I'm only going to take my grandson and 14 people. I want you to go. 
You can visit our website. All this information will be up on the website soon. We're nailing down the, the dates uh, right now as, as we speak. And I'm in communication with the uh, event planners about uh, the trouble over there. But I, as, as you know, as from my commentary, I have been over there during troubles like these, including the Yom Kippur War. I remember so vividly that war and the blackout that, that we had. I was a young student. All we could do was light candles. We played a lot of cards in those days, listen to the BBC at night to get the full story of what was going on. I want to take you over there for an unforgettable tour of the Holy Land. You can read all of this on the Meeting House. Also on the Meeting House, all of the podcasts, for instance, of the show today, my conversation with uh, William Ligon will be up on a podcast uh, by tomorrow. Uh, you can read all of the commentaries like the one I wrote. I think there's more than a hundred commentaries on the newsletter. Now I'm trying to pull some of these together to publish a new book, uh, a collection of these. You can subscribe to the newsletter. I send it out at 830 Eastern standard time every Wednesday. And it has the news uh, book reviews that I don't always get to include on the, um, on this live show. It's also, gives you an opportunity to make a contribution to support the meeting house where we try to have conversation on religion and, and, and American life. Now you can tell by today's conversation, I try to make a space for everybody. You know that I'm a voting Democrat. I'm a progressive Baptist, but my guest today, a staunch Republican, he and I disagree uh, strongly on the legitimacy of the election, but uh, he had his voice and I have mine. You can support what we're trying to do. Give a progressive Christian voice down here in red state, Georgia, or wherever you are, you can go to the meetinghouse.net slash support. There you'll find an address where you can send a donation or there's a way where you can give online. When you give, you become a member of the circle of 70. I launched this last year when I was 70 years old. I'm 71 now, going strong, happy, healthy, and hopeful. But you can be a part of the Circle of 70 if you make a contribution, any amount. And we'll add your name to the Circle of, of 70. I want to thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Also, I want to mention five weeks ago, I launched Dr. Moody's Bible class, Monday nights by Zoom. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I've got 26 people registered from seven or eight states from all over the country. You can register through the website. This is The Meeting House. We're coming to you, as we always do, over the radio. Rejoice Radio, rejoice975.com in Glenn County, 97.5 FM, FM 94.7 FM in Glenn County. And then also through the television, Facebook Live and YouTube, through the Ministry of the St. Stephen's Missionary Baptist Church of Louisville, Kentucky, TV. Thank you for your interest in uh, religion and American life. Thanks to my engineer, Everett Armstrong, down here in the studio in Glenn County, and the engineer, Alex Mattingly, working for the Louisville Church from a studio in Lexington, Kentucky. Until next week, I encourage you to get a vaccine. I'm just disgusted that uh, Georgia is one of the lowest percentage vaccine states in the union. Why is this? Order some coffee, perfectocoffeeinc.com. Pray for the soul of America. Be kind to everyone you meet. I'm Dwight A. Moody, your host in the meeting house. Have a great day.